So, um, as Benemino said, what um, I have been asked to talk about is uh, this very thorny issue of whether we should regulate at all uh, platforms, and if so, how try to regulate them. And so, I want to start with a preamble because very often there is now this uh, <coughs> new narrative about uh, the big tech being uh, evil somehow. And I want to say that, uh, number one, I have nothing against bigness. Uh, I think that in Italy there was once a myth of small is beautiful. In fact, uh, most uh, big companies at economies of scale are more productive. So big per se is, uh, is not bad. In fact, very often it's good. And of course, I have nothing against tech because uh, technology is what uh, provides the increase in productivity, which is what pro gives us an uh, increase in standard of living. And in Italy, in particular, we need that uh, desperately. And um, I don't want to be in any form or shape <coughs> on the side of the one who oppose uh, tech to try to protect uh, a modern virtue of the buggy whips. Technology does destroy existing model of businesses. The way to deal with that is not to protect the model of businesses, but to move forward and see new opportunities. Um, and, and I love technology in, in, uh, in many dimensions. Um, the reason why I said that is because very often I've done uh, a number of debates on, on this issue. Very often people say, but don't you love Google? Uh, how would you be without Google? How would you be without Facebook? Uh, and I said, look, uh, this is not the right choice. The right choice is not between having and not having. Um, I completely agree that having them is much, much better. Uh, the question is, uh, should we have them in this form or should we do something about it? And most importantly, what are the problems? So I think that uh, in order to think about whether we should regulate and how we should regulate, we should understand that this is a relatively new phenomenon that touches on four different areas. There is an economic side uh, that goes under the name of so-called two-sided platforms, and in a second I will describe what this is about and why this is so unique. There is, of course, and in Italy you are much more expert than uh, in the United States about privacy and the issue related to privacy. There is an issue about media because uh, many of these platforms are de facto media, and so they impact on the media world with all the consequences this has. And as I will say in a second, there is also a political impact that cannot be ignored. In fact, uh, recently at uh, Chicago, uh, the Stigler Center I direct had a conference on many of those issues, and that's the link. You can uh, uh, see all the panel that took place during this two-day conference, where some of these issues were debated. In fact, most of these issues were debated. And, and one of the results of this uh, conference is that uh, we decided the Stigler Center to launch a committee that is both interdisciplinary and uh, spans across those four areas because it's very difficult to know how to deal with the problem if you put it all together. So this said, I will spend most of the time on the first issue because this is where my comparative advantage is, but I want to touch also the others because I do think they're very important. So for those of you who are not familiar, what is a two-sided platform? A two-sided platform is an economic platform with two distinct group of users that provide each other network benefits. So think about the old world of classified ads before even uh, Craigslist existed. The old world of classified ads took place mostly in uh, newspapers. And uh, if I am interested in renting an apartment or buying a second-hand car, I want to go and buy a newspaper where most people uh, post their ads. And if I am a seller of a car or a, 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 the locator of a, the tenant of an of a apartment, I want to post my announcement where I know most eyeballs are. So this is a, a two-sided platform. And I, on purpose, use an old-fashioned example because two-sided platforms were not invented yesterday. Um, however, the surprising thing in economics, there have been analyzed seriously only since the beginning of the new millennium. So it's relatively recently that uh, there is a literature specific to this phenomenon that, as I will tell you in a second, has particular implication. And if you look at the, the existing world without understanding that it is two-sided platform, you fail to appreciate some of this feature. 
Another example from uh, the, the, the 20th century, not the 21st century, is of course credit cards. I want to use a credit card where most uh, uh, shops, uh, accept, that most shops accept. And on the other end, of course, as a shopkeeper, I want to have a credit card that most people use. So uh, my using of the credit card provides a benefit for the shopkeeper, and the shopkeeping adopting the credit card provides a benefit to me. Um, now, the other things that I, in part, explain is the benefit of each group exhibit economies of scale, which I think is very important, and that's what I, I just described in a second. So, why analyzing the problem as a two-sided platform is important? Number one, because it's well understood now, in a two-sided platform, you tend to subsidize the more sensitive side and then charge sometimes maybe even overcharge the less sensitive side. So uh, let me make an example that I will use it later. In the United States, uh, the market for real estate, if I want to sell an apartment, is uh, for historical reason a market that is exactly a two-sided platform and run by a cooperative or real estate brokers that have a system called multiple listing service. And the system is designed that if you are a buyer, you can get a real estate agent and pay nothing. And say, how the real estate agents are paid? They're paid out of the seller uh, proceeds. So the seller uh, provides a 6% commission on the value of the house sold. Of this 6%, 3% goes to the real estate broker of the seller and 3% to the real estate broker or the buyer. So, as a buyer, it costs me nothing to get a real estate agent. Now, cost me nothing, I put in quote, because of course, in equilibrium, it costs me a lot. Uh, but in, uh, uh, if I look at my individual choice, I'm subsidized because the other side is paying for me. And this mechanism was there way before actually uh, the digital platforms were created, and so it's useful to understand, again, this is not a new phenomenon, is that now it's become extremely pervasive because people are used to have stuff for free. Uh, now, as I will say, it's misleading because it's not for free. Like, uh, it's not for free that uh, I get a real estate agent, it's not for free that I use Google, it's not for free that I use Facebook, and so on and so forth. The second is that under certain conditions, these platforms tend naturally to a monopoly, a situation in which the winner takes all. Now, this is not inevitable. It's inevitable in two situations when the customer preferences are fairly homogeneous and, this is very important, and when multi-homing is difficult or impossible. What is multi-homing using two platforms at the same time. So again, old tech example in the real estate, when I sign with a real estate agent, I sign an exclusive deal with a real estate agent, so I cannot have two real estate at the same time. That is a mechanism to prohibit multi-homing. Uh, in the United States, where Uber and Lyft are readily available, uh, both the user and the drivers of Uber and Lyft can do multi-homing constantly. So uh, I have both apps, and I choose between the two depending on the price, and the drivers have both apps and choose the, the application depending on, on the demand and supply. So that's a case of multi-homing, where you don't not necessarily have a monopoly. The case of the real estate is a case with not multi-homing, where you naturally have a monopoly. And then the third aspect, which is very important, is the so-called risk of envelopment. What is this envelopment? Is the fact that a platform is crowded out by another platform that has the same set of users, but a different functionality, and adds a functionality. So the best example is uh, Paytm in India is a way to pay people uh, with messages they added a messaging service to compete with WhatsApp. WhatsApp 
is adding a payment system to compete with Paytm. So uh, those are platforms that play a different function. One is to send messages, the other to send money, but they are the same set of users and it's not very costly to add a functionality. So why this is important? Because of course competition comes from a completely different place. So I am a service that provides payment, maybe originated by a bank, and I compete with the social media. Or I'm a social media and I compete with a bank. So the barriers of competition that we're used to have are disappearing. And what are the implications? Number one, the zero price is not a good indication that consumer benefits. Most people say, I love Google because I pay zero for it. And this is wrong in two ways. It's wrong in the way I just described of the real estate example. You do pay. You pay in equilibrium because the ads are more expensive. You buy the products, and those products reflect the price of those ads. So that's the number one. Number two, of course, with Google and Facebook, you pay with your data. So the idea that the product is free is absolutely misleading. Now, it's very important, I'm not sure I will have time, but it's very important from a political economy point of view because uh, consumers love Google and Facebook. And so it's very difficult for a politician to say, I'm going to try to regulate Google and Facebook because people don't understand this step. The second point is that, uh, uh, at least in the United States, but also by and large in Europe, having a monopoly because you are the best is not a crime, is not something that should be punished. So if I am Google and through organic grow, growth, I achieve 90% of market share. I am doing nothing wrong, okay? And the antitrust, nothing can do against this. However, however, if I achieve that monopoly position through acquisition, think about Facebook that bought, bought WhatsApp or Instagram, or if I use my monopoly power in the search, search market to assert a, a monopoly or to have some advantages in another market, unrelated, like for example, shopping market, then this is an antitrust violation, something that the antitrust should consider. Finally, from an economic point of view, there is a challenge in thinking about antitrust with the two-sided platforms because the very notion of markets and market share disappears. So first of all, if the product in principle costs zero, how do you define market share? Market share is generally a bunch of sales, and there is no market share there. So that's problem number one. Number two, when I told you the story about the risk of this envelopment, I think that uh, uh, the competitors are defined in different industries. So you need to understand across industry how to do it. Then, of course, there is the gigantic issue of privacy. And uh, my favorite story is a true story about a, a father who went to Target complaining that his daughter of only 15 years uh, got a, some advertising for uh, pregnancy stuff and for kids. And said, how could you dare send in this material to my daughter? And Target apologized deeply. A month later, the same person showed up again and the customer representative was very concerned because she thought that this was, it was angry and uh, said, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing because my daughter was pregnant and not only I did not know it, she did not know it. How did you know it? And the answer is very simple. Uh, when women get pregnant, they slightly change their uh, sensitivity to smell. And so they're very likely to change their perfume, their deodorant, their creams, all this product. So uh, ta target as an algorithm and say, if you are in the fertile age, you're a woman, and you change in a short period of time these three products, boom, you're very likely to be pregnant. So we are in a world in which large companies know about us more than we know about ourselves. Okay? And that's, I think, uh, poses new threats or new challenges that I think are unprecedented. It puts a political risk. Uh, if you are in, uh, in China, of course, you're very worried about this. But you know, even in the United States, uh, companies end up giving information to government. And I think the idea that the government is benevolent is hard to swallow 
even in Western democracies. So I think that that's, that's a, of course, a, a serious political risk, and there is a market risk. So suppose that I search uh, with my Google for uh, AIDS and symptom of AIDS, and all of a sudden I get denied my insurance because I'm a high-risk uh, customer. So this is uh, something very, very important. Uh, in addition to that, there is the fact that uh, data are essential to train artificial intelligence, and this creates a huge comparative advantage for people who own that data. And now, I don't have to teach you this because Europe is much ahead in the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis the protection of privacy with GDPR, but these are issues that are quite important. Let's move to media. Democracy is intrinsically related to the world of media. In fact, modern democracy started with the media. Yeah, there were the free city states in uh, in uh, uh, Greece and then in Italy, uh, they didn't need the media because we were small towns. The moment you have a large democracy, you need a mean of communication with the people that vote. And even the least intrusive government, think about the United States, actually spend a lot of time and resources thinking about how to preserve this. So most people don't know that the reason why in the United States they create a state-owned post office was an exception in an American system where state-owned companies were basically non-existent. They created a state-owned post office. Why did they do it? In order to subsidize the circulation of newspapers. And why they did it? Because newspapers were essential for democracy. And then when uh, media started to become radio and TV, they started to put regulation, the FCC, to make sure that uh, the uh, diversity of opinions was reflected in the media and some level of accuracy information was reflected in the media. So why not apply this to social media? Now, of course, there is a huge issue of censorship that needs to be dealt with. The last and most delicate topic, politics. Media have always influenced voters. However, in the past, we either had competition, many newspapers to choose from, or regulation, TV. And in Italy, we know all the regulation for the parity of opportunity uh, in, before elections. Now, the problem with uh, the social media is they're much better at disguising their impact. There is very reliable research that shows that just the ordering of news on Google tremendously impact undecided voters, and so can result in election going one way or another. And you know how Google ranks news through an algorithm. Who creates the algorithm? People. The biases of those people is going to be amplified by two billion customers. So 20 engineers in the Silicon Valley controls the minds of, 20 billion, sorry, of two billion people around the planet. In fact, uh, I have a podcast that I will let you, uh, um, I will refer to you later, that is called a two billion Truman Shows because that's what social media are about. And actually, Facebook, until recently, was bragging about the ability to influence the 2015 British election. Of course, after the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, they brought down that information and so on and so forth. But this is the, res the reality. How do we resolve this? I think that uh, all this uh, issue suggests that uh, there is a need to consider regulation. I'm not saying we should jump the gun, but we should consider regulation. I think there are some very low-hanging fruits. And the first one is uh, to try to increase competition and multi-homing by introducing regulation that favors competition and multi-homing. So the people, the older people in this uh, uh, room remembers probably a time where your cell phone number belongs to the company that was providing the cell phone services. A regulation was brought in in Italy and in many other countries imposing number portability. I have some research showing that countries that impose number portability tend to have 
cheaper phone services, and no worse quality. In fact, if anything, better quality. So number portability is beneficial to competition. Competition is beneficial to consumers. But this number portability is not God-given, must be brought in by regulation. And actually, as you know, the uh, directive that uh, was introduced uh, uh, early this January brings in Europe account number portability for uh, the, uh, your bank account, uh, which is a huge step in the direction of creating more competition in the banking services. And what I say is we should do an extra step in making social graph port portable or facilitating multi-homing. So in the United States, if I give Beniamino my login and password on Facebook and authorize him to take some data from my Facebook account, he commits a federal crime. Why? Because Facebook made sure that was a federal crime. Uh, there was a startup called Power Venture that was disintermediating Google, was basically allowing you to log in in all your social network and post your picture in Power Ventures, and Power Venture automatically was bringing all the social, the, 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 the social uh, media. So this was creating multi-homing, creating competition for Facebook. Facebook brought a number of legal cases, and finally, uh, first of all, ensure that a company fail and wants a legal battle to impose this as a rule of uh, the land. I think changing this, facilitating the number portability is actually an important step in that direction. But I think that we should not be afraid to think more radically. In fact, uh, people think that uh, the idea of breaking up a company is uh, only in the mind of the most radical leftists. First of all, it's not true. In the US tradition, uh, Standard Oil was broken up, AT&T was broken up. But let me read you this uh, uh, passage from a piece of a very famous economist. And uh, I offer a drink to who is able to guess who is the Nobel economist who wrote that. So the obvious, obvious and economical solution is to break up the giant companies. This, I would emphasize, is the minimum program and is essentially a conservative program. And why is it conservative? As explained later, because instead of having continuous interference, you have a nice cut and then you let company go on their own. Now, the author of this is nothing short of George Stigler. The year was 1952, so many, many years ago. But the idea, I think, is still valid. Of course, there are countervailing forces. You don't want to break up Google because there are enormous economies of scale in search. But, you know, what are the economies of scale between Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram? I think the possibility of breaking them up is actually uh, in, on, on the table. And the last thing is to treat them like media. Uh, at least in the United States, Facebook and Google got away by redefining themselves as digital platform, non media company, and being exempted of all the liabilities and the responsibilities that media companies have. But Facebook does screen for context and choose actually the context that makes you most addicted to the social platform. So they do act as an editor, and why they should not have the responsibility of an editor. If you want to learn more, I have a podcast called Capital Isn't where I deal with this issue and many others, and you're welcome to watch it. Thank you.